Well, good morning, everybody in the U.S., and uh, good day to everyone in other time zones to the Gulf in Intelligence uh, Global UAA, UAE Energy Forum 2021. Um, this is the uh, panel discussion on the outlook for U.S. energy independence in 2021, which is a uh, pretty catch-all um, topic, um, and we have a very uh, international group of uh, experts to discuss over the next half an hour, after which we'll uh, be taking a 15-minute Q&A. Um, it's the usual protocol. Um, if everyone could please um, send their questions via chat, we'll do our best to, uh, to pick out representative ones to put to the panel after we've uh, discussed the topic. Um, let me just introduce the speakers first of all. Uh, we have um, David Graber, who's uh, um, editor of the GERM report, which is Geopolitical Energy Risk Monitoring, Clipper Data. Um, they, um, <clears throat> David has uh, um, a lot of experience international and uh, in the US as an analyst. Um, Mike McGlone is a senior commodity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, since 2016, Mike has uh, had 25 years in the market as a uh, senior head of research at e ETF Securities and uh, various other um, institutions. Randall Muhammad is VP of Energy Solutions at AHART Solutions, uh, formerly uh, was a partner at Kamar Energy in Dubai, um, a particular expertise in, uh, in natural gas. Um, and David Rondell, um, who is a uh, Longtime diplomat and Saudi expert, author of Vision of Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the crossroads. Um, David also has been a business consultant for the last several years. Uh, let me just, first of all, introduce the subject briefly, then I'll, I'll kick it to, um, to each of the panelists. Um, the, uh, the topic, is, as I see it, has got uh, a number of ways we can cut it, but I mean, we uh, definitely want to touch on uh, what we see is the outlook for the oil industry under the Biden administration, what the changes we think will be important um, uh, as, uh, as these new administration takes place. It's, uh, I guess it's, um, we would see this as the, the cabinet being fairly green leaning, but um, there's also, uh, um, you know, a certain amount of continuity that we could expect. So if we could uh, touch on that, there, there's other, uh, aspects that we want to look at uh, internationally, particularly how things will change for the Middle East and specifically within the Middle East, the uh, the approach to Iran, um, whether we'll, the administration will want to go back to the G GCPA or uh, and at what pace it might want to do that. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that the uh, Trump administration has been a um, has been one that the uh, that the Gulf, uh, most of the Gulf uh, countries have have been have seen as fairly kind, but it's uh, but it's also been a very uh, uh, Tel Aviv centric policy. I guess we could agree. So um, the implications for that. Also, um, there's a, a new approach to climate policy on an international and domestic uh, basis, and um, I think importantly for for energy, I think everyone will agree is uh, how the China relationship will evolve. Uh, there are many more um, aspects we could touch on, but uh, first of all, if I could uh, go to you, Mike, um, for uh, your thoughts, first couple of minutes on, uh, on our topic. Mike, you're on mute. Mike, you're on mute. Sorry if you would. Well, that helps to get off mute. I guess I was trying to be too polite. So I have to admit, I'm overall, um, thanks for starting me, I, uh, uh, Tony. I have to admit, I'm, I remain bearish crude oil prices. I think the key significance of last year is we have had a, bull, a bear market for quite a long time, since the peak in 2008. And last year, put in a low. I think we can all agree for negative 40 WTI was probably a low. But I don't see an end in the massive trends. And massive trends remain excessive supply and reduced demand estimates. And I say that because it's a lesson I learned early on in the 80s that it's not so much demand that matters, it's the demand revision estimates. And they've been downward for almost a decade, again, including this year. Everybody keeps having these optimistic um, views for global demand. It's not happening. So let's start with what we start. The main premise is this is the U.S. So the bottom line for me is U.S. and kept me bearish for quite a while is 
there's one metric I really watch in Bloomberg, and that's U.S. crude oil and liquid fuel net imports. Now, it's called net imports because it was 10 million barrels a day 10 years ago. And last year was the first time we kicked that paradigm shift and switched to exports. Estimates are by the end of this year, it'll be back to ex exports, particularly with WTI above 50. Shale's coming back on. Um, and, you know, I see patterns very similar as I've seen since the peak in 2018. We had those little peaks around two, in 2019, and I'm getting similar signals now. And for me, for crude oil to remain at these levels or higher, I have to see, um, the way I have to see it is U.S. supply needs to probably not pick up, which is unlikely. Demand needs to really pick up much more than it has in the last five, 10 years. I see incremental declines. And I have to see the stock market sustain higher. And I say that because if I look at a lot of my metrics, correlations with the stock market are the highest ever. I've got data to go back to 1960 on that. So um, I'm somewhat bearish. I'm even very skeptical, skeptical of copper at these levels. Eight, you know, $8,000 a, a ton of copper is, uh, if, even if you're bullish, it's extremely overdone these levels. So I'm looking for a bit of a reset. And um, I'm much more bullish to metals, industrial metals, things that have limited supply and more demand than things that are being replaced by technology, which is energy. With that, I pass it back to you, Tony. Uh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, I should have mentioned uh, the <laughs> the economy, which, of course, uh, the outlook for the economy is the is the kind of base for uh, everything else that we're looking at. Um, let me just go to you, Daniel, if I may, and uh, it would, if you uh, could pick up the the thread on. Uh, um, what uh, Mike was saying about um, supply and demand. It's, uh, you know, do, do you think there's going to be anything on a short term that the Biden administration is going to do that could curb uh, supply growth, domestic supply growth in the US, which uh, the EIA and I think most people are uh, forecasting will grow, uh, has already been growing and will grow pretty strongly over the next couple of years? Well, I, you know, before the panel um, opened up um, live, we were talking about, you know, the ramifications of the unrest last week in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, I've written um, a few commentaries, you know, pondering if, if we're going to have something of a political Trump hangover um, hanging over the, the, the U.S. political scene over the next few months. Um, you know, we have the likes of Ted Cruz um, still um, towing that ultra conservative line. So I wonder if we're going to have, you know, even though, you know, we're going to have a Democratic controlled government um, come January 21st, we're still going to have that undercurrent of protest, I think, within the, you know, the right wing of the Republican Party that's going to try to make life difficult for um, Joe Biden. That said, you know, he's been on record saying he wants to limit um, hydraulic fracturing on federal lands. Um, that could be a detriment to long-term production going forward. But then again, we have to look at 2022 when EIA this week said they expect, um, you know, things to get back to quote unquote normal in terms of a de demand scenario. So is that 1 million barrels per day cut out from U.S. production from a Biden administration really going to matter that much? Or is it going to be supportive of crude oil prices in the long term? Um, speaking of the, you know, broader implications of, of energy interdependence, uh, you know, that's going to be a difficult line for the Biden administration to walk as well, particularly as it embraces a green energy platform, given that the United States um, lags behind the rest of the world in terms of rare earth elements. Um, you know, if, if the Biden administration is seek, seeking a reset with China, um, it's going to have to, you know, walk a delicate line not to be beholden to a ch uh, ascendant China in terms of rare earth elements. Meanwhile, at home, we have, you know, uh, Pete Buttigieg, who's been, you know, on record saying he's he's going to be tougher on some of these pipeline infrastructures. So short term, I don't know if we're going to see any major reset in U.S. Um, energy policy. Um, long term, it's about catching up with the rest of the world in terms of the renewable energy push. And, you know, we'll have to see what 2022 brings once we get back to quote unquote normal. So back to you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Randall, let me just. Uh, uh, pick up one thread there um, about the, um, uh, the what's happening with the, with trade policy um, and particularly with China. I know uh, gas is one of your specialties and uh, the trade policy with China obviously had implications for, for gas exports, but um, take it wherever you want to go with it. But uh, with the Biden administration's uh, policy that Daniel was touching on, um, which might impede uh, some drilling in, in some of the areas, some fracking particularly. Um, 
Do you think that the that that very strong push towards gas exports that the uh, Trump administ administration was uh, uh, was looking for will be impeded in any way over the next few years? Yeah. Hi, Anthony. Uh, thanks a lot, and good day to everyone from the Sunshine State of Florida. Um, look, yes, you know the U.S. Um, has become a net exporter of, of LNG. Um, you know, gas, in fact, in 2019, gas of, overtook uh, coal in uh, power production. So that's, that's a good thing uh, for the environment. However, if you look at the Biden's um, plan, which is a nine point plan, on the top of that list is reduction in methane emissions. And as you know, Anthony, a lot of that methane comes out of um, what we call associated gas uh, production, um, especially in the Permian Basin, where we're seeing a proliferation of flaring and venting um, of gas. So certainly, I expect tighter regulations on methane emissions. Um, you know, there's something that the TRC, which is the Texas Railroad Commission, has been battling with um, over the last four years, as Trump sort of um, wound back a lot of those uh, regulations. So I can ex you know, expect a lot more tighter regulations on methane um, emissions. Um, and I think that will probably have an impact somewhat on the production of natural gas and the production of, uh, of LNG. I mean, right now, China um, is really driving the LNG market. You know, most of that demand is coming out of China um, and predominantly the Asian market. And I expect that trend will continue um, over the next decade. Um, and I think it's in China's interest to also diversify uh, its supply, um, notwithstanding you've got pipe access to pipeline uh, gas coming out of, uh, of Russia. Um, and, you know, we are seeing pipelines not just heading towards Europe, but eastwards towards uh, China. So again, that puts uh, competitive pressure on, on US uh, LNG. If you recall, the former uh, Secretary of Energy coined it freedom gas. Um, you know, and this was gas really meant to um, support the, the LNG sector. Um, one, one point, Anthony, to mention um, you know, you spoke about the banning of fracking on federal lands. Now, it should be noted that that could constrain production coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, what we call the Outer Continental Shelf, which is under federal jurisdiction. At the moment, um, that produces around 2.3 million barrels of oil equivalent uh, per day. So if there is some kind of uh, curb on leasing and permitting, it could impact uh, production coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, which could then um, see the USA um, in second or third place. Um, and then the final thought is independence. You know, what do we mean by US energy independence? Independence from who and independence from what? Is it independence from uh, importing foreign oil or is it independence of fossil fuels? Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, Randall. Um... David, if I could go to you now, um, there are a number of uh, questions in your bailiwick that uh, on the topic that I want to touch on. Um, I'll leave it to you to uh, to emphasize those that you think are the most important. But internationally, um, obviously, I mentioned the, the Iran and GCPA and what might happen there. Also, the relationship with with Saudi and, and other uh, uh, Gulf members, but. Um, um, the, uh, the the foreign policy team, which I guess um, you, you'll be quite familiar with, um, there's 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 Kerry, there's uh, Anthony Bilkins, uh, um, and uh, the the policy that uh, that they might develop, and I guess um, uh, Mr. Burns at CIA as well. Um, uh, what do you think the foreign policy, the impact of the foreign policy that the Biden administration might develop, uh, would have on the energy? policy, international energy policy. Just, just uh, if you go off mute, uh, David, please. I'm absent-minded. Thank you. Um, there we go. Now I'm off mute. Okay. Um, 
I think I'm here in two capacities. One as an independent oil and gas producer myself in the Permian Basin, and second as a diplomat who spent most of his career in Saudi Arabia. So I look at it from both the domestic and the international perspective. Um, and I think there are a couple of things that just might give your listeners a feel for what the mood is like in Midland at the moment. Um, and it's a certain, the, the key issue there is uncertainty. Um, on the one hand, people are pleased that oil is now, seems to be above 50 again. Um, most importantly, we're not paying a differential. You know that when there was an excess of production and you couldn't get your oil into a pipeline, you had to take a discount on the uh, posted price or the listed price. Uh, that's not the case anymore. So if, it, if the price is 50, you're getting 50. Um, and there certainly has been a reduction in um, costs. Acreage costs, obviously, depending on where you are, have gone down. Uh, drilling costs have gone down by maybe 20%, and even the housing market in Midland is down uh, by about 4% last year. So all of those things um, are reducing costs. You would think that you would see an increase in um, production. But right now, and again, your listeners probably know this, but the rig count is it's about 100 and, I don't know, 175 last week, uh, which is dramatically down from the highs. But on the other hand, the production has not fallen by anywhere near as much as the rig count. Um, and so if you're looking at, you know, the, I guess the peak was what for the, na for the nation was 13 million barrels, something like that. And now we're down to 11. That's still a lot more than the six that we were, you know, back when the shale fracking uh, began. So there's still a huge increase in production. Um, and I don't think that is uh, going to go away. The other big news, I think, in Midland is the mergers of um, many smaller independents and some that aren't so small. Concho is hardly a small company. They're getting merged. Um, and then the final thing is the difficulty that the very small independents, uh, people like myself, uh, are having now uh, in the sense that uh, it's it, it, the bigger players are getting uh, getting rigs and getting the oil field services quicker. And so there's a bit of a, a waiting line even uh, to get some of these services done. So that I think was one of the things that Sean wanted me to talk about was sort of the, uh, the mood in, um, in the, if you will, the mood in Midland. Um, the second issue which you addressed, which is uh, the foreign policy issue. Um, I think that you're right that the clearly the appointment of the people that were involved in the Obama administration, strong supporters of the Iran nuclear deal, uh, particularly uh, Bill Burns, uh, who helped negotiate that. I think their appointment clearly indicates that there will be an effort to revive that in some way. Um, my own feeling, and this is my own analysis, but uh, I think it will be more difficult to do that than they may think. I'm not sure that the Iranians will just accept the same old uh, agreement, and I'm not sure that we would accept the same old agreement uh, just put back in place. I think we will ask for um, controls on some of their missile testing and perhaps uh, improved behavior in uh, some of the uh, foreign fighting, the uh, foreign fighters, uh, the foreign legion of proxy armies that they have supported uh, across the, the region. So I'm not sure it'll be quite as easy to put Humpty Dumpty back together as some people uh, may think. I also believe that the new come in, the incoming administration uh, will, while they may give lip service to the idea of making Saudi Arabia a pariah state, uh, I think they will quickly realize that <clears throat> Saudi Arabia remains important, uh, very important to global energy markets, and that they'll continue to have a relationship, a cooperative relationship with Riyadh. They may, um, there is a human rights issue there. There is a human rights problem that, uh, that they will want to address, but I don't see them breaking their relationship, the longstanding relationship with Saudi Arabia. 
And we can talk about that uh, and why that is. Uh, but I think um, that's probably enough for now. And I'll let uh, Tony go on to the next speaker. Thanks, David. Well, let me pick up something that you said with your um, small producer hat on there. Um, and I'll, I'll throw it to Mike first and then just uh, let everyone else weigh in. Um, the, um, and and you, you touched on this too, Mike, um, with your opening comments. The most important thing for US production um, over the next, over the near term, a year, year or two years, um, is going to be obviously what, uh, what the price are, what prices are and what demand is. Um, also, the, um, the, the, the financing structure, I don't know if the pandemic uh, has done much to financing structure for the, the, the small uh, swing producers, but maybe you could just touch a little bit uh, on that. And, and do you think that if, let's say, the, there's, there's a difficult slow pace of recovery in the economy from the pandemic and, and uh, raising finance might be a, a difficulty if that will um, maybe curb the extra production that most forecasters are looking for? I think that's a key bullish factor is the financing is going, all the money I see flowing is towards anything like ESG, clean energy, like you mentioned earlier, um, and old school um, carbon, the, the trend in decarbonization, it's just not politically correct to have money flowing towards producing crude oil anymore, even natural gas to some extent. So to that extent, that's a bullish factor because it might limit production. But all that money is flowing towards reducing demand, clean energy, you know, um, reducing EVs, solar panels, all the above. So to me, that's the macro factor um, that is pointed out from an investor standpoint, which I usually look at. Okay, and people have been telling me how cheap energy stocks have been for two years and maybe they're coming back. Um, but you watch a lot of these clean energy things, they're just taking off. So the key thing I see is way over optimism for a return to the quote unquote normal. And the, I like to point out as normal before COVID was a bear market for crude oil. Um, I was bearish crude oil and began really kicking in in 2019 after we had that initial bounce. When the U.S. went, became a net exporter and the U.S. is a net exporter of energy, depending on how you measure it in terms of liquid fuels. Look at our, our you know, I'm from a farming background and almost 15% of um, unleaded gas in this country is now sourced from corn. Um, it's up a little bit lately, but... Um, to me, those are macro trends that are going to accelerate. The Biden administration is going to accelerate the supply side. It's not going to help the demand side much. And what's revert back to the beginning is before COVID, we had a bear market for crude oil. Do I expect that to change? No. I see the levels here. Just as, um, as David mentioned, costs have, re been, have been declining in U.S. producers. And that's been the biggest significant paradigm shift on the planet in the last 10 years is U.S. shifting from a net importer to net exporter of I would say, um, petroleum. Back to you. Thank you. Um, if uh, th there was one one question that popped up, I, it's it's one that um, I'm not sure if anybody um, takes seriously. Uh, in, uh, you know that, that the U.S. might cooperate in any formal way with with OPEC in terms of limiting production, if um, if that seemed to be uh, um, something that would that would help you know, U.S. policy in general. Um, it's, uh, if, just, I, I'm going to throw that to David, uh, if, if I may, first, and then just uh, send it around to, the, to Daniel and Randall. But David, did, that, that's, that's popped up from time to time, some sort of cooperation. I don't want to, you know, overemphasize uh, that because it's um, it just is in, not, not really in keeping with the U.S. approach to things. But uh, do you think they might, there might be some kind of shadow cooperation or any kind of moves that might um, benefit OPEC in terms of uh, curbing uh, U.S. production in any way? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the uh, it was an unusual event for the uh, Trump administration to intervene with the collapsing prices. I don't think that, uh, and it was done largely to help the domestic oil and gas industry. Uh, and I don't think that that is... Um, something that the uh, Biden administration would particularly want to do and in light of what we've just heard that they're not interested in trying to support the domestic oil and gas industry, uh, which is focused on in states which by and large uh, didn't vote for them. Um, the other comment I would just add in, in terms of the internet and the other, the other thing is I just 
to add there quickly is that it's very difficult for the United States to um, control its oil and gas production by fiat. That's one of the things that makes Saudi Arabia the central bank of, um, of energy, if you will, is that the government by fiat can dictate what production should be. Uh, that's very unusual in the United States. It, the Texas Railroad Commission, in theory, has the ability to do that. But even at the, as prices were collapsing, there were some very heated public meetings where some people were screaming for the Texas Royal Commission to act like OPEC. And most people in those meetings uh, were, even as prices were collapsing, were adamantly, they didn't want the government setting prices or what they would really do is set production quotas. So I don't see that happening uh, either because the Biden administration would not in be interested and even because the producers themselves probably don't like that kind of government interference. Um, the other comment I would make on the, wearing my other hat is the international hat, um, is I think people tend to focus a little too much on the United States. Um, yes, global, um, United States demand is probably going to decline. But if you've been to China or India lately, there are still a lot of people there riding bicycles. And there's gonna be a long time before they buy a Tesla. And uh, I go to those places and I, I think that the demand in those places is still quite significant. And that's so, well, in Europe and the United States, which are basically declining proportions of GDP for the globe and are gonna be declining in terms of their energy use per unit of GDP, yes, I think you'll see a reduction in demand, but I'm not so sure that's gonna happen in, in Africa and, and Asia. So that would be my thought. Uh, thank Thanks. you, David. Yeah, that, that uh, point about the, the energy transition is, has been a topic since, what, a couple of decades now. Uh, but the key is the pace of the transition, right? The pace of the transition in the individual economies. Um, and I guess the, uh, one of the keys for the U.S. is will the pace of transition here accelerate? And I guess the implication of that is if, if the Biden administration was successful in um, pushing through investment in infrastructure for uh, elect electric vehicles, uh, he's got um, his, his energy uh, secretary, uh, um, is, is, is someone who comes from Detroit uh, or Michigan. And, and obviously that's, that's sort of statement about policy on uh, pushing forward with, with that part of the transition. So if the US, if, if we assume that the US is going to uh, accelerate its transition, um, even if not the, you know, the pace that Biden uh, has set forth with the uh, power, you know, uh, carbon free power by, by 2035, that's, I think many people think that's probably uh, way too ambitious. But even if it does accelerate, um, in, in terms of uh, the U.S. relationship with the world, would that mean that it would become an even greater fossil fuel exporter? Uh, let me, uh, Daniel, if, if you wouldn't mind taking that one up. Oh, yeah, and then yeah, thank you. There's some really interesting ramifications if you think about the transition to, um, you know, a greener energy future. I don't think that the um, the renewable energy sector isn't quite as interconnected as, as say, the oil sector, you know, unless we start talking about car carbon trading scheme, you know, Platts just rolled out um, a pricing mechanism um, earlier this month on carbon. So we could see the international community collide uh, in the energy space uh, that way. But, you know, I'm looking at, you know, the, the overall topic of energy interdependence. And I wonder, um, you know, we talked about, you know, the push by the, the small energy producers um, in April who were pushing for artificial intervention in the U.S. oil sector. And we had, it was Ryan Sitton, who was an outgoing chairman at the Texas Railroad Commission, um, Parsley Energy and Pioneer, I believe, were all kind of pushing the, the Trump administration for some artificial intervention with oil prices going on or going so low, going negative in, in some instances. But then we see the U.S. energy sector secretary come, in, come out and say that would, you know, violate some antitrust issues. So I don't know that, uh, you know, that we have two different competing conversations here where we're looking for a greener energy future, but we're also looking at a Trump administration who was able to use some leverage in the energy space to coerce adversaries, um, be it with sanctions or whatever the case may be. You know, Trump 
administration made a great deal of, of brokering the Saudi Russia um, oil price war earlier in the year. Is the Biden administration going to be able to to maintain that leverage? Could it maintain that leverage through, say, natural gas in Europe? Can it maintain it as, as a net crude oil exporter into the European market? There's a lot of open ended questions on what this new transition will bring and what that will do to you know, this so-called energy dominance or inter- energy independence. Um, you know, before the panel, I was stuck studying some of the um, 1970s texts on, you know, the liberal order and, and found that, uh, you know, cooperation I- is better. Um, and you can either be sensitive to change or you can be vulnerable to change. And I think the United States, no matter what trajectory it, it, it seeks, needs to be less sensitive to change rather than um, expose itself to b- vulnerabilities. So back to you, Tony. Thanks, David. We're just going to go to uh, to some questions uh, now in a moment, but let me just uh, ask you, Randall, if you uh, want to weigh in on that um, topic that we were just talking about, and and also picking up on something that you mentioned earlier. The uh, um, it was was a question from one of our um, one of our participants uh, about Russian pipelines. I think this is in relation to to um, China's uh, demand for gas and, and where it will be sourcing it from. The, the Russians have had um, a lot of pipeline issues. Um, and this is for oil and gas, I presume. Um, it will take several years to fill it. Um, and, and this is actually, he's asking a question to David, but I'll, I'll throw it to you first, Randall. What is uh, your assessment of a break-even point for Permian today? Oh, I'm sorry, that, that was, <laughs> I was thrown into the same question. Let's just, uh, Randall, just, just. Sure. <laughs> We'll go back to people's yeah. uh, <laughs> no. outlook for price. Yeah, <laughs> Randall. Yeah, let, let me just let me just ask you about about chi- China, China, Russia, and its sources of supply. Right. So no problem, Anthony. Um, look, undoubtedly, it's going to take um, some time um, to get that infrastructure um, into China. But having said that, I mean, look what has happened with uh, Europe. You know, you've got Nord Stream One, you've got Nord Stream Two which is, yes, it was under pressure, especially during the Trump administration, but it looks like the Russians may pull it off. Um, And I don't think there's probably room for the Biden administration um, to object uh, to it. So you are gonna see additional supplies of gas coming into into Europe uh, from Russia. Don't forget Russia also has LNG capacity um, as well. So we we can't discount that as well. But I think the bottom line is, look, um, from where from where I sit, I think there's a, a healthy uh, future for natural gas and LNG. Um, let's not forget that LNG is a cleaner burning fuel than, than diesel um, and, and, and other heavy fuels. Um, in Europe, for instance, you know, there's a big push to get LNG into heavy trucking. You know, the energy efficiency gains are massive with LNG, um, you know, on a, on, a, on a single tank of LNG, um, you can get almost a thousand kilometers. Um, so that's massive efficiency gains. And if, again, if you come back to the Biden uh, nine point energy plan, one of his plans is to make heavy trucking more energy efficient in the US. And, you know, we see an opportunity for LNG in uh, transportation in the US. Now, mind you, in 2019, the US consumed about 142 billion gallons of gasoline. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a huge volume. It's one of the largest consumers of uh, gasoline. I don't expect EVs to be a drop-in uh, solution. You know, that's, that's more of a medium to long-term uh, um, solution. But having said that, I think the pandemic has weighed in um, on fuel demand. We're probably going to see uh, 2020 end with a 10% drop in, in fuel uh, demand. And lastly, um, Anthony, I just want to touch on um, the international relations with, with OPEC. And I think, um, you know, we've seen 2 million barrels of oil removed from U.S. production. Um, and that is a result of, you know, companies simply cutting back, no demand and uh, pricing issues. But, you know, if you look closely at what is happening in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, if the Biden administration says, 
okay, guys, we're going to cease leasing and we're going to cease issuing drilling permits in the Gulf of Mexico. The forecast is that you can see a fall off or curtailment of about 1.2, 1.4 million barrels per day. Now, what happens? You know, how does the U.S. fill that void if demand begins to pick up in the next five to six years, for example? Where is it going to come from? Then you're looking at a scenario where the U.S. would begin to ramp up exports, um, predominantly from the Middle East, because the quality of oil produced from the Gulf of Mexico is very, very similar to what is imported uh, from the Middle East. Back to you, Anthony. Thank you, uh, Randall. Um, let me just uh, ask um, my colleagues to uh, pop up the first survey question, and that'll take a few minutes uh, for people to, to answer. Will U.S. domestic oil production increase during the Biden administration term? Um, this is obviously a topic that we've um, discussed as we've uh, as we've been going along here. Um, let me just uh, also now, just as we've got a, about uh, nine minutes left, um, go to uh, some of the questions that we've got from the chat here. Uh, a Biden administration is likely to uh, implement stronger oversight on the environment and rejoin the Paris Agreement. Will the will this ultimately be the savior of U.S. oil majors who have failed? to find their own pathway to diversification and reform. Um, that is something that we sort of touched on uh, before, but it's, um, it, let me see, let me start with uh, uh, David, if you don't mind uh, picking that one up. Can you repeat that again? What is the exact question? Sure. Um, a Biden administration is likely to implement stronger oversight on the environment and rejoin the Paris Agreement. We, I think we've touched on this. Right. Um, the question is, will this ultimately be the savior of U.S. oil majors who have failed to find their own pathway to diversification and reform? I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, how, how it means it'll be the savior of, of the well, oil companies. I don't understand. Uh, look, um... but, yeah, I mean, take, I take it whatever way you want, but I think, I think, I think the Biden sorry, I'll go on, I'll go on mute, but um, I, I think it's probably uh, trying to say, will it force uh, majors to do, to do something quicker than they have before? Ah, uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't, I, you know, that's a question for the CEO of Exxon, really, but I uh, don't think that he's going to change his, um, the structure of his company. Uh, just now, I don't know the answer to that, really, to be honest, and I and I don't want to pretend that I do. Um, I don't think that environmental regulations are going to change the overall demand structure on the global, in a global sense, and I think that the American majors uh, are global com companies that look at the world. In fact, if you look at their production, most of it's not in the United States anymore. Uh, that that's just a fact that you know that the mo that in fact if you looked at Exxon a few years ago they were actually an African com company, so whether they're they they look at global demand and global supply, uh, they're really if you will multinational companies uh, not American companies so it may affect their domestic operations substantially but I don't think it's going to turn them into a uh, get them to change their strategic orientation just because of what the Biden administration does which I'm not saying I disagree with what the Biden administration does, but I don't think that that's the only thing that the Exxons and Chevrons of the world are gonna be looking at. Right, um, I, I mean, I, these, these companies, uh, whether they're the US majors or other majors, they, they by and large uh, make decisions based on investment. I mean, one of the points that Randall was talking, uh, touching on there was that investment in the, uh, in federal waters um, in the U.S., um, if if they find that they are uh, blocked or it becomes less profitable to invest there, they'll they'll find other places to invest. That seems to be what has happened before. And I I guess they'll make the investment decisions uh, about um, what they do in terms of um, transitioning themselves to clean energy companies will be based on the, on the same thing. We have seen obviously some moves. Um, even by Exxon in that direction, but it's uh, let me let me throw this to Mike now. Whether or not um, it's it's substantial, whether or not you think there's a a change in the investment climate that would affect uh, what majors do with their money over the next 
decade, I guess, would be the, or five, five years to 10 years. I hope so. I sense the smart ones are going there. And I actually didn't try to look at BPM like they were very smart enough to pick green as their logo cover color. And I mean, that was a smart thing to do years ago before clean energy was cool. But the key thing we need to focus on with the Biden administration is this administration is is accelerating the inevitable process of of decarbonization, electrification, and digitalization. Technically, de and technology basically used gradually, and then all of a sudden, we're in an all of a sudden stage. The Biden, uh, the Trump administration tried to repress a natural trend. This Biden administration is just going to accelerate. It's already happening. I mean, you talk to someone like me, I already have solar panels. I have an electric car. One of the rare Americans, and believe me, they're wonderful, but I did it with subsidies. And I think that's going to be what we're going to see in this next four years is a massive trend this way, pretty significant, significant acceleration. And all the old um, fossil fuel companies of the world, if they don't adjust, they're going to fail. That's just the way life is. And mar markets are happening, moving so fast. It's the clean energy companies. So I, that's why I look at it as, as a broad commodity guy. I think I just don't see the upside for petroleum and fossil fuels, but I see the upside for metals because everything we talk about needs more metals um, and metals are in, 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 in limited supply and the demand's picking up. Thanks. Let me just ask my colleague now. We're just uh, getting close to the end, uh, but four more minutes. Um, if uh, you could put up the second survey question, please. I've kept this very fossil fuel orientated, but uh, I think that's... Um, that's probably appropriate on the topic. Uh, will the Biden administration policies slow the U.S. push for gas exports? Again, this uh, came up earlier on in our discussion. Um, and I, it's behind the question, obviously, or uh, has to do with the uh, U.S. relationship with, um, with uh, its trade partners. Um, let me just uh, throw this other question in. This is, this is from the, uh, from the, the chat panel. Um, and it's from uh, earlier today at one of the other panels, Sir Mark Moody Stewart, who you'll all be familiar with, um, former Shell CEO and uh, a long serving member of the Aramco board, um, said that um, uh, Mid East OPEC producers are getting closer and closer to the inevitable day when the low cost producer will have to open all the taps and pump as much as they can, just like any other commodity. Uh, what does that inevitable day mean for U.S. energy industry and so-called energy independence? So this is um, this is kind of another way of looking at uh, uh, one of the questions that we've been talking about earlier. Daniel, let me uh, let me ask you first. Um, that uh, what we saw, I guess, during the pandemic was the U.S. Um, acting as as the swing producer, really, um, in terms of how much production fell um, and then rebounded. But uh, the implications for, uh, uh, you know, do you think it will, uh, the other thing that's contained in that question is you don't really need a, a cartel if, if that would be the case. Anyway, uh, let me throw that to you. Uh, well, we'll see what happens. You know, I, I'm, you're, you're mentioning the, the lowest cost producer. We saw the UAE energy minister, you know, earlier on one of these panels say U.S. shale shouldn't, you know, check yourself, you know, U.S. shale um, on running ahead you know, with too much production, but I, I think um, it's a double-edged sword that the more the United States produces, the the more it's influential on the, that price point. You know, we saw that play out during the Arab Spring when the United States was kind of intervening sort of in a way to offset the pressure from Libya. Uh, on to the rest of the, the point, I don't, again, I don't know that um, inter interdependent uh, global markets have room for independent producers i don't I, I i i think that the the web of interconnectivity is far too dense in the global energy space to deep decouple one producer from the next um let me just throw, throw uh, there was a question for david um and and we'll just start use this as a the start of a quick fire round if you don't mind we're just about a minute away from wrapping up um and for david how do you explain recent steps by saudi a uh, peace with Qatar, de facto peace with Israel, a unilateral cut of a million barrels a day. What is what is that signaling, I guess? I don't think there's necessarily a connection. Some people have said that that's all done to arrange their relationship with the Biden administration. Perhaps some of it was, but I think all those things had their own independent causes. So I don't, I don't link them all together. Um, I think the issue with Qatar was, um, was a, didn't wasn't working. Uh, the effort was to try and bring Qatar back into uh, the GCC. 
uh, the question on the oil price was it was an oil price question. What was the third one? Um, it was about the unilateral cut of a million uh, barrels yeah, per that, day. That, I don't think that, that, that you know, some people have said they've done that to, to help the American oil industry to make the Biden administration happy. As I said earlier, I don't think the Biden administration is particularly interested in helping. I'm not saying they're out to destroy it, but I don't think it, it, encouraging or subsidizing the American oil and gas industry uh, through their foreign policy initiatives is not something that they're working on. As uh, others said, as Mike said, you know, their interest is in, if you will, subsidizing, if they're going to subsidize anything, it's going to be towards a, a greener economy, not towards sustaining the oil and gas industry. And the Qatar thing was a different issue. Um, Somebody asked me what I thought about oil prices in the Permian Basin. Is that, was that quickly? I'll just be very quick about that. And, I'll, and I don't know that I'm right, but the number that I'm using at the, the, currently is about 45. We can, I can drill and make money at 45. Great, thank you. Um, so just uh, I'll start with Mike and then we'll just, just quick final thoughts. Uh, some, anything that you, uh, that you guys wanted to bring up but, uh, but didn't get a chance to or, or just uh, summing up what you uh, think on the topic of uh, U.S. energy independence um, and any changes we might be uh, seeing in the next uh, couple of years. Mike. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Close your remarks. The U.S., um, it, it, certainly if you include Canada, is, Canada is very much an energy exporter, certainly in terms of fossil fuels. And the best way to increase that process is higher prices. The best way to reduce that is lower prices. And I think the new administration is going to accelerate this inevitable process of shift of decarbonization of technology taking over, replacing energy and crude oil prices should remain subdued and I'm more biased to metals as far as being a long-term commodity bullish outlook. With that, I pass it back to you. And thanks again for having me. This has been great. I learned a lot from my colleagues. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, let me just uh, um, give you the results of the uh, the survey that we had will the U.S. policies um, change the uh, push towards gas exports? Um, that's an overwhelming uh, no. Seventy five percent significant minority think yes. I guess twenty five percent on the oil uh, production increase over the Biden administration. That's uh, two thirds uh, um, expect that we will continue to see an increase in oil production over the over the four year administration period. Um, and a third think not. Um, Randall, your final thoughts? Yeah, thanks a lot, Anthony. Um, so look, I think, you know, I think the next decade or so is going to be extremely, extremely challenging um, for US oil and gas. However, in the near term, I don't see a big impact um, on, on LNG exports in particular. Let's not forget, uh, Trump had actually increased the export permit on LNG to 2050. Whether, and that was done via executive uh, order, whether the Biden administration walks that back, it's uh, left to be seen. But definitely I can see tighter regulation on meth methane uh, emissions, especially out of the, uh, the Permian. Um, on the issue of oil production, um, I don't think, you know, price is the main driver for oil production. And I don't think I'm, you're gonna see any real interference from the Biden administration, except for uh, leasing and drilling on uh, state uh, lands, predominantly uh, offshore drilling. Thanks. Thank you. And, and final word um, to you, Daniel. Well, I'll be interested to see, you know, how the Biden administration is going to overcome some of the trust deficit in the international community that was baked in from from the Trump administration. Um, you know, the isolationist policies under under uh, the Trump administration are certainly going to be uh, priority number one for the Biden administration, particularly as it seeks to uh, bring in um, players to to reset this Iranian nuclear deal. On an international relations perspective, uh, you know, I wonder what the Biden administration is going to do on gas. Um, particularly as it, you know, we talked about the Nord Stream pipeline earlier, you know, is the United States be, going to be able to continue that energy leverage with with natural gas? Uh, you know, we see, you know, we've seen in the past how Russia can really, you know, subvert the whole European continent by, you know, shutting off things in, in Ukraine. Nord Stream used to be a panacea for that. Now it's this adversary with this onset of, of US LNG. So it'll be interesting how to, to, how to see that move forward, particularly as we look forward to this post-pandemic world, you know, I think the pandemic really 
was a fundamental shift in the paradigm of international relations. And to say, okay, is it going to be back to 2019 levels? I don't think it ever will be back to, we'll never get back to pre-pandemic. So there's a lot of more questions on our, I think, answers, you know, as we, you know, look forward to the new Trump or the new Biden administration taking office in a few short days. Um, thanks for having me on this panel. I learned a lot as well. Um, I appreciate your moderation, Tony. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike, D uh, Randall, David, and Daniel, and uh, and to our participants as well who uh, were listening in and who asked questions. Thanks so much, and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Anthony. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.